We've been in a, a series of the hard questions of our faith these days, and, uh, and we come to the last one in this series, not that this is all the hard questions we would ever ask or have asked of our faith, but, but you get the point that there are thoughtful answers to all of them, and, and with a little work, a little effort, um, our faith stands. And so this morning we are going to ask the, the final question about uh, uh, our source book, the Scripture. And to take a look at that, this question, we're going to look at uh, the Gospel of Luke and, and in two passages in the Gospel of Luke, one near the beginning and, and one near the end. The first is the beginning of the Gospel, the first four verses of the Gospel of Luke. Listen now to the Word of God. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And then, from the end, near the end of the gospel, the afternoon after the resurrection of Jesus, in, verse, in chapter 24, beginning at verse 13, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what's this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the, our, our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, guide us as we consider your word. Guide us in considering 
um, how it stands up to modern scrutiny and even our own. Guide us as we stand before your word and seek your leading. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Christianity is dismissed by many in our culture as our source book is dismissed. And one of the assumptions of those who dismiss Christianity this way, I think, is, is somewhat correct. We believe the Bible to be God's revelation to us of what he wants us to know about the world and ourselves and him. And if we can't trust it, then our understanding of these things, our faith, is on shaky grounds. So that, that's, I think, a fair assumption. The part I disagree with is the assumption and belief that the Bible is not a reliable picture of the way things are, including who we are, who God is, and and where all this is going. People of, uh, are critical of the Bible for different reasons. Some say it's been used to justify terrible things in history like tyranny and slavery and oppression of women, and that too often is true. But I would say that those things are not supported by the actual context, content of the text. People likewise say that the Bible has good things, but it also has bad things and, and historically wrong things. And as such, it's, it's simply not a trustworthy for anything more than insight and inspiration. So at best, it's, a, it's approached like any other book from any other time. I disagree. I believe it is trustworthy, historically and culturally, and, and most importantly, it's personally a faithful witness of God and His Word and His world and His will. First of all, historically, a, a key criticism is that the story, particularly of Jesus, was merely written by the victors. That the, that the theology and the portrayal of Jesus represented in the Bible was was presented by the church leaders who won their power battles hundreds of years later. And it reminded me of the, the finale of the recent famous musical Hamilton. I, it's been on Broadway's nine years, and it's still the most expensive ticket, but it's kind of been in on my family's thoughts recently because a couple of weeks ago, our daughter, Anne, who lives in New York, surprisingly won the lottery. They have a lottery to go to it, and she went with a friend for a Hamilton for, for $10. And so we've been listening to it again. And the last song asks the question, who lives, who dies, who tells the story? Hamilton died tragically in a duel with Aaron Burr, his, and his rivals outlived him. And so the story of his impact on American history was, was lessened relative to others who got to tell his story. Except his wife, Eliza, outlived him by 50 years, and, and most of his rivals as well. And, and she kept alive his contributions to the story of our nation's founding. We have a modern notion that, that history is written by the victors. Thus, it is fundamentally agenda-driven and is fundamentally not trustworthy as real history. And when you apply this to Jesus as portrayed in the Gospels, critics will say it didn't really happen that way. And, and they try to read behind, it what, read behind the text what actually happened. It, it, and the notion of an alternate, more historical Jesus is, is portrayed in the popular novel and movie, The Da Vinci Code, portraying portraying the divinity of Christ as being fabricated by Emperor Constantine in 325. 
and, and that it's not tied to the historical Jesus. And the notion is that ideas like Jesus claiming to be God or miracles or the resurrection are all fabricated by, by later church leaders. But this is, honestly, it's an unfair and a, and a wrong assessment of the portrayal of, of Jesus. And let me get to just three quick reasons here, but there's many, many more. First of all, the New Testament accounts of Jesus are written simply too early to be fabricated. Luke fact-checked with eyewitnesses. Even though he wrote 30 or 40 years after Jesus' ministry, he, he made sure it was right. He was a historian. Paul was even earlier. He, he also refers to the eyewitnesses of the resurrection and, and quotes an already established early hymn about Jesus' incarnation. The understanding of who Jesus is and what he accomplished comes from people who were there. Secondly, the documents, they say, are, are, the, the documents are too counterproductive in their content to just be legends. Let me explain. There are things that we would not make up to put into the story. They're not, they're not flattering to anyone who would pass it on. We wouldn't hear, if we made this stuff up, we wouldn't hear about Jesus asking for the cup to be passed from him. Things like Jesus crying out as abandoned on the cross. We wouldn't have women be the first and key eyewitnesses to the resurrection in an age when women's testimonies were not admissible to a court. And even these two men on the road to Emmaus are doubting them because they're women. So, so often the key followers of Jesus, the disciples, they're just not portrayed well. It's not flattering to them at all. We wouldn't put that in there. These are not reminiscent of fiction, but of real details of history. Finally, as a whole, the, the, de the accounts of Jesus are too detailed in their form. It, it doesn't fit ancient literature. Keller quotes C.S. Lewis, who's a real expert in ancient literature, saying this, Lewis wrote, I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, myths all my life. I know what they are like. I know that not one of them is like this. Of this text, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage or else some unknown writer in the second century without known predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic, realistic narrative. The reader who doesn't see this has simply not learned to read. The Gospels as literature are unique in the ancient world, and, and they are clearly meant, as Luke states, to be accounts of what actually happened. The sum of all these things is that the eyewitnesses are still around. The negative portrayal of many of the leaders doesn't lend itself to, having, to, to actually not having been the case. And the detail in the literature is unique. All of it points to the historicity of the New Testament. And if you believe the Jesus of the New Testament, you also have to respect his view of the Old Testament. Last week, I, I mentioned Tim Keller uh, telling about an atheist friend of his who had had doubts about his own atheist faith and the assumptions that he carried with it. Among those assumptions was the, the belief that religious people had a naive, uncritical view of the Bible and that it's full of errors and contradictions. But when he was questioning this assumption, he said... Since coming to your church, I realized that there have been a thousand PhD dissertations written on every single verse, and that for every contention that one verse contradicts another or is an error, there are ten cogent counterpoints. Keller writes, he rightly lost his faith 
that he could ever find a difficulty in the Bible that was unanswerable. Historically, the Bible and Jesus has a lot of ground to stand on. But that's not the only criticism of Scripture, and probably not the primary one that people today have. In the postmodern world, there has been a shift that people are more upset by the the cultural aspects of Scripture than the the historical. They read things they simply find offensive or primitive or regressive. Davis and Berge, in their recent book that I recommend, The Great De-Churching, explains explain this saying, explain it with this saying, there has been a hard turn culturally in the West toward justice and ethics. This culture's questions are more about whether Jesus is good and beautiful and less about whether he is true. In response, I I certainly, I can't address each instance of people's criticisms of, of the Scripture, particularly because what these things are that offends people continues to change. But I want to I say three things that help us when facing texts that offend people. First of all, consider the possibility that it doesn't teach you what, it, what you think it teaches. That's what's happening in the text this morning. Jesus redirects the men on the road to Emmaus in their understanding of Scripture. We need to be patient with the text. For instance, one of the things that we could easily find as offensive is the patriarchs and the way they treat women. There's polygamy, there's primogenitor, which simply means that only the first son gets nearly everything in inheritance. There's bride prices. That, all that stuff and so much others is just not ever stuff that we can condone in our world. They're offensive. But they happen right here in the Bible with the heroes of our faith. Years ago, a a famous literary critic and, and a Jewish Old Testament scholar named Robert Alter wrote a famous book called The Art of Biblical Narrative, and he noted that that polygamy and primogenitor are are universal in the ancient world. And the people portrayed in the Bible, they they simply reflect that. Even so, when you look closer in the Bible, the text of the Bible portrays polygamy as a complete disaster in every every time. And, And consistently, primogenitor turns out not to be God's practice in choosing whom he favors to carry on the story. Think of David, the youngest of many brothers. They they had no expectation of him, so much so that they made him a lowly shepherd and left him out in the field when they were considering who God was calling to lead the people of Israel. Over and over again, the text is subverting the cultural practices, especially with women. Don't give up on the text Look at it in historical context and see what it is saying in and to that context. Secondly, we have to consider the possibility that we are understanding what the Bible teaches because of our own cultural blinders. Emmaus walkers were only considering the redemption of the Jews, not the redemption of everybody. Critics of the Bible have often considered it to be as condoning slavery. Many, with just that assumption, have tossed out the whole of it. But you have to consider two things. First of all, imposing a a picture of 18th and 19th century slavery, the, the one, the slavery that we know as Americans, upon the text is a mistake. First of all, the ancient context of slavery was different. Slavery was not race-based or language or clothing-based. Slaves were never segregated from society. Often they were more educated than the owners. They earned the same wages as other people, and they could buy themselves out of slavery. Very few were slaves for life. They were more like indentured servants. Still, they were encouraged to leave it if they could. But secondly, while while the Bible doesn't actively condemn this ancient 
context slavery, neither does it condone slavery. Rather, slaves' rights as fellow human beings and even brothers and sisters in faith are clear. Subsequently, Christian leaders motivated motivated by Christian principles of human rights led the charge to abolish slavery in the 18th and 19th century and even today. Even today, we're at the forefront of the effort to combat human trafficking. It's there you'll find people motivated by their Christian faith and, and biblical principles. Those who used Scripture to support slavery had their cultural blinders on. They twisted Scripture to justify their own prejudices. So when you read Scripture and something seems offensive to you, please consider you may be reading it through your own cultural blinders. Next, you may be offended by certain texts because of unexamined assumptions of your own cultural context. And they'd be very different from other cultural contexts' views of the Bible. Our, our culture reads about blood sacrifices to appease justice. And it, it doesn't fly. No, no blood should be shed for justice. Forgiveness should be much simpler than that. For Jesus to have to die to appease God's justice is offensive to many in, with our cultural sensibilities. But go, go to any Middle Eastern culture or cultures around the world. And what is often as is offensive is the idea of any forgiveness or mercy at all. And if there is forgiveness, it's, it's not going to be cheap. Someone has to pay the cost for there to be justice. Which means scripture, which is set in, in cultures different than our own, and which clearly offended people then. After all, Jesus offended them enough for them to crucify him. It's, it's likely to have other places which would offend us as well. Each culture is different. The question is, do we let our cultural mores condemn Scripture? Or do we take a look at ourselves in a mirror through the lens of Scripture? Those places of offense are probably places that are worth digging deeper and seeing what's behind them. Every time I've done it, I've grown in faith and understanding of, of the breadth of the cultures of the world and of my own assumptions of things and of the beauty and comprehensiveness of the story God has us in. This is not to say that Scripture is always easy to understand, but somehow it seems to give us what we need. I've used this picture before, but it sticks with me. I, I had a biblical studies professor once quote a description of the Gospel of John that you could apply to the whole of Scripture. The, the Scripture is like a, a pool in which a toddler could safely wade and an ocean in which an elephant can drown. Read it. Anyone can understand it and know the key things that God is telling us about himself and, and our salvation in Jesus. And then you can spend the rest of your life exploring its depths. Okay, so far it feels like it's been a lecture. And, and uh, less so a sermon. But the whole point of this message is to help us not set aside Scripture easily. Rather, we can address our excuses and ultimately set them aside, set them aside, and trust Scripture. Do you trust it? I don't mean in theory, I mean in practice. And by trust, I don't mean do you trust it to merely give you political or moral positions. This is not primarily a book of ethics designed to tell you what you're supposed to do. That approach to it just ends up in legalism, and, and the Scripture becomes a hammer used in power games. What Scripture is meant to be is seen in what happens in this story we read this morning. 
two men are walking on the road on their way to Emmaus. And their leader and their hope had just died last week. And they have just had their world come crashing down around them when Jesus died on the cross last Friday. They had all their hopes on him, and he's gone. Someone else joins them on the road and starts explaining all that had happened through the lens of Scripture, not explaining rights and wrongs so that they could take it up in their hands and, and be right. He was explaining why all this happened. He explained the story of Scripture. He, he goes back to Moses. Moses write those first five books. He started at creation. He started the story of creation and then the fall and now redemption through Jesus. And not just of the Jews, but of all who trust in him. Now they see themselves and they see God. And, and who they come to trust through Scripture is Jesus. I find the phrase they use when they reflect on Jesus explaining the Scripture as descriptive of what Scripture is meant to be. As Jesus taught, their hearts burned within them. Now they get it. And they go from men whose worlds have just collapsed, which, which honestly characterizes every one of us as we're subject to the consequences of the fall, every sin and death, they go from that deflation to men who see what happened to Jesus was not the end of hope, but the source of it. Scripture gives them the eyes to see that and to see the, the comprehensive enormity of it. Here's the thing. Most people dismiss Scripture, either in principle based on their assumptions or too many of us, even in the church, in practice. Often we, we just see it either like it's inspirational, it's likely to have some good wisdom to help us through the tough days of life, or it's like a, or it's like a hard truth so that you can stand up to all the confusion and lives, lies swirling about in, around us. And I'm not saying it doesn't have both of those things, but neither of those things do anything to change us. That's not what happened on the road to Emmaus. Jesus spoke to them through the Scripture until their eyes were opened. They understood the story they were in, who they were in it, and who Jesus is. And most importantly, they realize Jesus had been walking with them all along. Let's pray. Lord, we read Scripture and the story. And part of that story is, by the power of your Spirit, you're walking with us now, Lord. And, and all these hard things, um, they change everything, including your death on the cross, especially your death on the cross. God, help us not dismiss Scripture, not either <laughs> with modern worldly assumptions of it, nor with our own just simple um, setting it aside from our daily lives. God, help us to be people of the Word who, who see in it who you are, who we are, and your will for us, your salvation of us, the sending of your Son for us. And God, in the sight of it, may we be changed every day and forever, knowing that forever stands ahead of us as we know it in your word, forever with you, God, thank you for the hope, the promise we see in it. And 
the history and what you've done and the future and what you have and the present that you walk with us even now. God, thank you for your word. May we be led by it evermore. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.